Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. Welcome to the Think Big with Dan and Kasim today. Our guest is Justin Smith. Justin, how are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. So good. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Justin, let us know where you live and what you do. Sure. I am uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina, so I've got a base of operations there. Um, and what I do, I am a private jeweler. So I'm a graduate gemologist, been in the business for over a decade. And I own Hourglass Diamonds here in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we do pretty much all bespoke jewelry, custom manufacturing design. You know, we've got a global reach as far as our gemstones and diamonds are concerned. And then manufacturing facilities around the globe as well uh, to ensure that we're able to get, you know, kind of the best stones at the best price and be able to manufacture at the highest quality. Awesome. So uh, you got this business in your inheritance or there was something that inspired you or pushed pushed you towards this uh, business? Yeah. So actually my background to kind of give a little bit of kind of context here. So my family has been in the business since the fifties. My grandfather used to mine his own diamonds in the Rupin Indian, South America. Um, they opened up a store here in Charlotte back in the early eighties. I did end up working for them for about a decade as well. Great store, a lot of really interesting pieces there. You know, I, I learned a ton while I was there. The catalyst for me was really more so about two years ago, I had twins. And so the retail hours really weren't conducive to trying to figure all that out and help my wife. So um, I ended up leaving the company and went to another large company, more on a global scale. And so I was one of the lead GGs for the US there. That was kind of a, a partial catalyst because obviously being on the wholesale side, I'm dealing with jewelers all over the globe. And so, you know, I was running multiple teams overseas here, doing a lot of training, things like that. But I missed the big aspect of being able to deal directly with clients. And so um, about a year and a half ago was when I opened up my company here and just started to kind of grow it organically as much as I could, you know, while working for the other company as well. So uh, that was really kind of more of the catalyst is is being back in face to face with clients, you know, especially hearing a lot of the stories that I hear from people that are going into the local jewelry stores and things like this. Um, you know, the sales side from a consumer's perspective, you know, a lot of times they feel like it's very pushy. They feel like uh, they don't know what they're doing. So they're looking for kind of a guiding hand. Uh, and that's really where I wanted to step in and and be able to help as much as I could. Awesome. So uh, what do you believe sets your jewelry or uh, maybe the process of your business apart from your other competitors? What sets me apart from other competitors? So a couple of things, especially locally, you know, a lot of times when you get into going into a jewelry store, you know, there's a ton of overhead associated with that. So a lot of stores have, you know, cases that are completely full. And really what you're doing when you're walking in from the consumer side is, okay, well, I'm just going to pick from the case and I'm going to wear it and I'm going to try to enjoy it. Well, coming from that standpoint, You know, and I tell my clients this, all of them have heard me say it at one point or another. If I get you 99% of what you wanted, I've failed, right? Because we do custom and we do custom very well, but that does not mean that you should have to settle. You know, there are certain things that we won't do, you know, as far as durability concerns and things like that, but that would be one of the biggest pieces. So A, you're you're able to completely custom manufacture, design, and we can design everything together. A lot of people forget that the jewelry buying process should be a very fun process, right? So, you know, you should be able to walk in confidently, you know, whether you have the knowledge or not, but confidently know that you're getting the best help possible and then getting the best product possible. So, you know, as far as how we're different in a nutshell, you know, we don't have a lot of overhead, which allows us to be very nimble. We can kind of pivot. We bring in stones. You know, you're not, you don't have to settle, you know, when you come to us. And it's done in a very fun environment as well. Makes sense. So you and your family are being in this business from decades and, uh, must have a lot of knowledge about it. So what do you say uh, the marketing in this business works well when it is offline or when it is online? So, and that's very interesting too. And that's a great question because as of right now, so I consult 
for one of the world's largest diamond and gemstone brokerage firms. So we sell all over the globe. So I get a really unique perspective, kind of a bird's eye view of what's happening coast to coast with different jewelers, depending on, you know, the different cities and where they are in the country. But as far as the marketing perspective, you know, a lot of people found, you know, kind of the Facebook and Instagram ads to be phenomenal for years. And they were. But I think, you know, as Facebook has grown and has turned into, you know, what is it, over a $1 billion valuation, you know, a lot of times now, the companies that are benefiting most from the advertising there, they have tens of thousands of dollars to spend. So for smaller companies or companies looking to get kind of the most bang for their buck, you know, what I've found that works very, very well, and it is a much slower growth, right, with much slower reach, but more of that grassroots type marketing. So, you know, whether it's sponsoring, like, for example, my nephew, you know, soccer team, whatever else, sponsoring jerseys. So the parents are seeing these things day in and day out every weekend, something along those lines, making sure that you've got, you know, merchandise that people are actually and, you know, happy to wear and promote your product. And they're happy to be able to kind of show it off as well. So, you know, the grassroots thing for me works really well. Uh, I've seen a lot of other jewelers that that's worked as well. Getting into the community is another big piece to that. Uh, networking, obviously going to certain networking groups and being able to kind of promote your business that way without, I hate the business card throwing, you know, you walk in, do a 52 card pickup with business cards, and then you walk out. That's really not what you want to do. You know, I mean, a lot of times from kind of where I'm standing, if I can help first, if I can give some advice, or if I can help somebody else achieve a goal, usually they're very happy to kind of reciprocate on that angle. So that's kind of where we focus as opposed to going into some of these big magazines and spending tens of thousands every quarter for a subpar result because everybody else is doing the exact same thing. Makes sense. So what's the stage when you can say, okay, now my business can run on the word of mouth? Do I think it can run on word of mouth? Yeah. I think a, a big portion of that, especially in the jewelry business is referrals. You know, because if you if you go back and kind of look at even your own families and things like that, everybody has a jeweler, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best jeweler, but they have one. And so I think a lot of times when you find somebody that you really resonate with, you're going to, and well, and you have to get a good product and good service as well, right? But you're going to end up sending more people back to that specific point. And that's kind of where I would say almost 90% of my business is from, is from referrals. So, I mean, at this point, you know, we've got clients in every single state in the US and they're referring other people back to us. So it's been uh, that right there, I think, is the, the biggest key to being able to grow from my angle. All right. So if this is just 9%, then it's not a big part. Looks like it's not a big part if this is just 9%. And I think this this cannot be a thing where a business can rely. Okay, let's say I say I can rely only on, on, on the referrals and good of mold. So I think this will be a disaster for a, for a business if someone is relying on just word of mouth. Yeah. And if it were just word of mouth, you know, in the consulting company that I'm working with, uh, we would fail miserably as well. I think, you know, a lot of times you're going to have to go outside of the bounds to be able to really kind of grow. But I think on a local scale, and it really depends on the business too, you know, so if you're working on hyper local, then that's one thing that you can focus on. Obviously, if you wanted to expand out and have a much broader reach, which is inevitably what we're going to do long term, you know, then you need to figure out whether it's, you know, trying to get the most bang for your book on Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you know, obviously people trying to create viral videos. And, you know, that, that's another piece to, to be able to get it out and about. But yeah, I think a big piece of this too, is focusing on what the brand actually does. And so what do you want that brand to be? Do you want it to be a brand? Or in many cases, you know, specific to my industry, talking about other jewelers, they don't really have a good idea of what their brand is. They're more of a, well, if somebody comes in, I'll make whatever or we'll sell whatever. And so I think that's where, you know, our industry is making this massive pivot because you've got, you know, synthetic gemstones coming into the mix far more now than they have in the past. So lab grown diamonds were, you know, 47% of all the engagement rings sold last year in the US. That will potentially grow a good bit by this year. And so now you've got jewelers that don't really have a good solid brand, a good solid core and fundamentals, and they're finding themselves just kind of going whichever the way the wind blows. And so I think, you know, a big piece, you know, for businesses in general is creating that brand and that brand identity and focus. So people actually recognize and know that exactly what you're doing. Hey, y'all, it's Dan Melnick, the CEO of Zing. And I wanted to share a special offer for all of our listeners. Right now, if you need software development services, We'll give you two weeks of a free trial. You need to update your website. You want to build a mobile app. Do you want to 
update something that you've been working on for a long time. We've worked in a high-level technology like AI, machine learning, blockchain. So shoot me a text, 817-874-2208. Thank you. All right. So we are talking about acquiring the client. Acquiring a customer, acquiring a customer, there are multiple platforms uh, from where we are getting. Obviously, word of mouth is one of them. And uh, if we say like in your business, what is the percentage of new clients acquiring as compared to online and offline customers? Like maybe in offline, you can say on retail, maybe on the retails. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I would say, and I actually don't do very much online at all. And I think a part of that is because, you know, when lab grown became very popular a few years back, we had an explosive amount of people going online. And so now, you know, there's a finite source for all of us to be getting our diamonds from. And you have a lot of companies that have access to a global supply, and then you have a lot of companies that don't. And so, you know, when you're looking at the companies that do have the global supply, they have a very far reach as, again, a finite source that all all of us can go after. And so I didn't want to get stuck and pigeonholed into this, you know, what everybody in our industry is considering a race to the bottom with lab grown because the prices in 2018 versus now, I mean, I could buy a four carat lab grown for basically what the tax would be, you know, on a, on a two carat natural. So that being said, you know, I don't do a whole lot of the online piece, but as far as my retail business is concerned, I would say new customers coming in, uh, not on referral is only probably about 10%. Um, and a lot of what I'm doing now is just a, a ton of referral pieces. Now, if it's a more traditional jewelry store, a lot of times, obviously, you're going to have, you know, the longer that jewelry store has been around and the more visibility they have, the easier it is to find when people go in and it's like, oh, you know, engagement rings around me or jewelry around me, you know, you're going to pop up towards the top of the, the SEO rankings. But um, I think what a lot of us are doing is pivoting more to, I don't necessarily want to cater to everybody because there's a certain level that I just don't want to get into. Like I don't, I don't sell silver. Right. I mean, as far as jewelry is concerned, we'll do it for, you know, luxury barware and stuff like that. But, you know, as far as actual rings are concerned, I, I won't make anything out of silver. It's too soft. It's just a personal preference. Right. So a ton of other places will, and that's absolutely okay by them, but you know, they're, that is where that kind of brand identity comes from. You know, I don't really see too many people, you know, I'll go back a little bit. So you look at Tiffany's, right? They can sell you a $350 piece of, you know, sterling silver wire as a paperclip, but it's because it's Tiffany's, you know, they sell quite a few of them. They sell them in gold as well. Even if that is a very kitschy thing, I, I still am not going to make a, you know, a sterling silver paperclip for anybody. Like it's just not, it's not what I want to do, you know? So I think that's the other big piece of it. You know, so you've got those two main components as to, to where that falls. Makes sense. So in terms of location, how important is location in your business? I'm, I'm sure like you must be planning for, to sell it in different places and maybe out of states as well. But what's the importance of location whenever you are opening this type of a business? You know, it's really interesting. So if I were going to do retail and have a storefront, then retail, I mean, then location is obviously going to make or break your business. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I do think, though, that being in our business, in the jewelry business, most places are going to be more of a destination. And so you're going to be looking for, you know, what does this designer do? What does this designer make? Do I feel, you know, am I gravitating towards this? Am I gravitating towards a different person? So you're going to seek out kind of the designs and the manufacturing and the, the caliber of quality that you're going after, you know, or on the flip side, you're going to be chasing price, right? So, I mean, who has the cheapest, who has this, who has that, which is typically going to be more of your online sources. So uh, for me, location is not a dire make or break because I'm going to have more people seeking me out as far as that's concerned. But I would say, you know, if you're planning on opening up retail, if anybody's in that boat, absolutely. Location, 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 as we all know. All right. So gold prices are increasing day by day. And other metal prices as well. So uh, does it have any impact on the business, maybe on the sales? So because I believe uh, this is a major, major factor that will be going to hit the, maybe the customer, the buyer's capacity to buy, to purchase these things. So does it have any impact on your sales as well? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I think a big piece, you know, you look at gold, even now, gold is historically at the highest it's ever been. And so, of course, cost of manufacturing are up. The one thing that I can say that kind of works in our favor is the vast majority of the engagement 
business, which is, you know, primarily what we focus on. You know, that is already a rather large expense that people are saving up for, you know, and I hear the supposed to be two months or six months or a year's salary, whatever. It doesn't matter, right? It's whatever you're comfortable spending. But that may be one month's salary for you. That may be 16 years of saving up. I have no idea. But either way, you know, you're going to be saving up to to propose or, you know, whatever you plan on purchasing at that particular time. It could be an expensive bracelet or whatever else, but it, it's not like food. It's not like something that's a necessity in the sense that I need this to survive. It's a luxury good. And so I think in many cases, you know, that's why, you know, my, my clientele is a bit more affluent, but it's one of those major things that yes, you know, obviously everybody has a budget, whether you got a $1,200 budget, or if you come in with a million dollar budget, you still have a budget. And I think the biggest thing is making sure that we can maximize the impact of that, you know, and obviously we want to make sure that we're going above and beyond and we're not kind of over promising and under delivering, you know, from our standpoint, yes, things have been going up like crazy, but we also know that what we're going to try and do is maximize the absolute most that we can and kind of, you know, the bank for your budget. And I think that's really the biggest thing. You know, are you walking away feeling like you just got hosed or are you walking away feeling like, oh man, I, you know, yes, it was expensive, but this was a fantastic deal. And I got this at a really good price, you know, and I got really good quality. So I think the, what are you getting for what you're spending is a bigger kind of portion to that question. All right. So uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, like entrepreneurs face new challenges on a daily basis. This is something that I know. When I started my own business from that day till now, I am facing a lot of challenges. So what is the biggest challenge that you are facing right now? Or maybe you have faced recently and if you can share that challenge with us. Yeah. So actually for me, um, you know, I've been a private jeweler for a while. I've been a jeweler for much longer than that, but I am on the cusp of kind of moving into uh, like a storefront or an office space. And so I think for me, it's, you know, looking at interest rates, looking at security, looking at, you know, how much rent is going to be and rent is obviously at an all time high. And then you're looking at loans and then loans are coming with a 15% or 20% return in some cases. So, you know, trying to manage at this point, I've got zero overhead. And so moving from a zero overhead into taking any kind of overhead on, ultimately I'm losing money unless I'm I'm moving forward in sales. And so I think for me, that's been the biggest hurdle is okay, you know, speaking bang for the buck, obviously this is going to be expensive, but you know, what's the best way for me to utilize what I've got currently and then you know have my five-year projections to be able to get that in place and know kind of where I'm going to be month over month, you know, within reason, obviously. But uh, yeah, I would 100% agree with you that stress, you know, you need to get comfortable with stress if you're planning on opening up a business. And I don't care if that's, you know, making candles or bug collections or art or whatever else, you're going to end up having a ton of stress at some point in the game. And it's really about how you're going to pivot and how you're going to tackle that stress. All right. So what are your short-term goals in next three to six months? Uh, next three to six months is to be able to find the office. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, we're looking at a, a lot of different real estate at this point, just to make sure that we're getting into the right location. So that's the major focus. And then beyond that, I think it's more of kind of the marketing campaign behind that, you know, to get ready for it and everything else. So those are the two biggest ones. Awesome. So, uh, Justin, what would be your biggest piece of advice for our viewers? Uh, our viewers are mostly entrepreneurs and uh, and the new entrepreneurs who, and there are some people like who are just dreaming to be their own boss. So what would be your biggest piece of advice? I would absolutely, without a doubt, say if you're going to do something, do it the right way the first time, because ultimately it is going to end up costing you far more money down the line if you're doing something as a patch. So, and my wife's heard me say that a million times, you know, it may take me a little bit longer, but I'm not going to do it until I'm, I'm doing it properly. And that way, once you kind of set it and forget it, you don't have to worry about doing it again. Awesome. That's a beautiful advice for sure. So thank you, Justin. Thanks for joining us today. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, I really enjoyed your parents. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kasim. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. All right. Bye-bye.